Greetings fellow maker, you've got Bill in the shop today and I am embarking on what's likely to be the first of many Starfield builds. Uh, I'm doing the Rattler. Uh, in the last video I scaled everything and showed you how to do that. I've got the scale figured out. I have all my reference images all collected, ready to go to start 3D modeling it because I'm going to be 3D printing this thing. Uh, but before I dive into Fusion 360, I have a few goals, a few things I want to keep in mind. First, I plan on printing this on my resin 3D printer because I want that fine fidelity, but I'm also going to print it on an FDM machine because I'll be uh, releasing these files and other people are going to be printing them, so I want to make sure that it'll work on a variety of 3D printers. Next, I plan on using real screws and hardware on this thing, and I want to make sure that I can tap resin, the 3D printed resin, uh, without it snapping or anything, so I'm going to have to do some tests there. And finally, before I start 3D modeling, I want to figure out the mechanisms. There are two mechanisms on this that I need to figure out. The way that the magazine releases, and I think I've got that figured out already, but I also want to make it so that the slide kicks back when you pull the trigger, and for that, I have an idea. A few years ago, I made Robocop's Auto 9. This is made out of a toy, and when you pull the trigger, as you can see, the slide kicks back. As luck would have it, when I did that project five years ago, I bought two of this toy. So I'm gonna take this apart, see what the mechanism looks like. All right, we got it all apart and everything seems to live on this side here. And this is the entire mechanism. This is what makes it go pew pew. And we can see it's just a lever. So when I pull that, it kicks the whole thing back until it gets beyond a certain point and the whole thing goes forward. And the trigger part can just slide down out of the way to reset. Very clever. I'm gonna take a photo of this with my phone so that I know kind of where everything's laid out and I can copy it in Fusion. I'm ready to get started with my 3D modeling. I've got my references. I have the mechanism right here if I need to look at it as well as the photo I took on my computer. Uh, and while I was down in the basement farting around, my superhero of a wife was digging through the files from uh, Starfield and found and was able to extract the 3D model from the game of the Rattler. Uh, so I've got that now imported into Fusion 360 and I can use it as a reference for my modeling. It's going to speed things up a ton uh, and it was super, super helpful. Uh, but it also gives us an opportunity to look at this model in depth uh, I want to show you why we can't just take this model and just print that. So let's take a look on the computer. So this is a lower poly model. Uh, it doesn't have all the detail we need. In fact, it's missing a lot of pieces. If I bring my canvas back, you can see the top of the model doesn't have any detail on it and it's supposed to have this plate here. So I'm going to have to model that in myself. Uh, this is also uh, not split up into as many pieces as we want and it also doesn't have of course, the mechanisms that I want. You could try and just sort of fudge the uh, this, this model, edit it, but I think it's probably better to just start from scratch, kind of model around it. So I'm gonna get started doing that, focusing on the basic framework and shape of this thing uh, before we move on to doing some of the more mechanisms. little bit of progress started blocking everything out and it's looking pretty good pretty much all I've done is drawn a bunch of shapes using uh, sketches and then extruded them in various ways to get some of our forms here and it's going well and I'm gonna keep at it but I also have here a 3d model just a basic model with some holes in it these are 2.5 millimeter which is the uh, drill size you need for a 3 or an m3 tap we're gonna print this on the resin printer so I can do some of that tapping testing that I talked about earlier. Printing out my little test piece here, and now I'm gonna tap it and screw a screw into it and see how well it worked out. First, these are supposed to be 2.5 millimeter holes, and that's what this uh, drill bit is, and that seems to have actually hit the mark, which is pretty cool. Not a lot of shrinkage going on there. I'm gonna drill it out though, because there's a little bit of an elephant foot on the bottom of that. I don't wanna get rid of that. And I've got my M3 tap here, and I'm just going to run it through all of these. 
All right, let's give it a try. It's nice and threaded. Ooh, that seems to work quite well. It wants to hold. Let's tighten it all the way down and see what it takes to strip the threads. That feels really snug. That is very confident inspiring. I think we're good. So in my model, I know I can make a 2.5 millimeter hole and I'll be able to tap it with this tap and it will hold really well. Fantastic, that's awesome. I love doing these real world tests with real hardware so that I can move forward with my 3D model with confidence. Well, some time has passed. I've been sitting here 3D modeling for a couple of days and I've got most of the blaster roughed out. There's still a lot of work to do on it, but I've got all the forms in place. And I'm really happy with how it's turning out. I figured I'd share a couple of tips, some things I'm keeping in mind while I'm working on this 3D model. First, let's bring back the original. We can see that it's pretty much matched up, looking really super good, and I'm very happy with where it is. Uh, you'll also notice that I only have half of it. I've only been modeling half of it, and I'm gonna mirror it once I'm happy with everything here, and I'm at about that stage right now. Uh, you'll see over on the left here, I've split stuff up into different components for organization's sake. That's one of the guidelines of modeling in Fusion 360. Every new part you make goes in its own component where everything gets tucked away. Uh, like the sketches for the frame here all live inside just that one. Just makes navigating your project a lot easier once you start adding a lot of parts. Uh, but also, I've been splitting it up not only into these sections, but let's take a look at the, the magazine right here. Uh, it's got several pieces and I've split those up according to the material that I think they're gonna be made out of. So for example, if we look at the reference image here, this in the middle there's this sort of brass looking part. Uh, there's like a gunmetal looking part and then this almost bronze-ish looking piece here. Uh, and I figure when I'm painting these, I can paint them separately and then attach them after the fact. This will make it maybe a little easier to print, a little cleaner to print, but also it's gonna make painting a lot easier. I won't have to do any masking. So that's where I am right now. I'm about to mirror everything and then I need to start working on the internals, how all these parts are gonna interact. Lock together, some parts will be screwed together. You can see I have some screw holes. Some parts will be glued together and then some other parts are gonna have like springs and whatnot to make all the mechanisms work. So that's what I'll be working on next. It's a couple days later and I've done a bunch more work, although it doesn't really look like it. I've been doing all the fitment, getting everything to fit together correctly. And I've also been figuring out the mechanisms. Here on the back of the magazine, there's these two levers that when you pinch them, uh, they release it and it'll slide out. And then when you slide it back on, it'll snap and lock into place. It's actually only one of them that uh, does the action. The other one's just for show. It wasn't necessary that they both do it. Uh, anyway, I'm at a great point right now because I can start printing these pieces. So we're gonna fire up one of our resin printers, print them all out, and then we'll finally get to do a fitment test and see if the mechanism works. Our first parts they're looking pretty good now I can remove the uh, support material and do some test fitting <laughs> there we go if only it were that easy overall I'm super pleased with how the parts turn out but I think uh, next for the next print I need to do some manual supports you can see some spots where it clumped up a bunch of supports in one spot and left a big goober I've also noticed that for some of these little wells here uh, resin built up on the inside. I can go in there with um, a rotary tool and clean that up, uh, but I'm wondering if I print this in a different orientation, if I can avoid some of that. So I'll try some ne new things next time I print all my parts. But as for these parts, let's see how the fitment is. The first thing is this rail here it needs to slide down into that part like this. And it's pretty snug. 
if I sand that, it'll probably fit, and I think I'm going to do that. Uh, but I can also tweak the clearance on this part and reprint just this rail to see if I can get it to fit a little better. Here's the 3D model between these parts, and there is a 0.15 millimeter gap. That's actually about the thickness of two sheets of paper. <laughs> so there is a gap there, a thin gap, but it's not enough, not enough for this to fit together without working or sanding it. Um, so I can go in and tweak that gap, make it a little bit bigger. It's a little tricky um, until you kind of figure out your printer and the parts that you want to make and how to get them to fit together. What sort of clearance to leave there? When I'm printing on, or when I'm 3D modeling this on a giant screen, this looks like a huge gap, this massive gulf there. Uh, but it's not uh, really, in reality, it's two sheets of paper. So I now know that that needs to be a little wider. Uh, another thing I can test are my screws. Most of the screws I'm using on this are M3 screws. So I've modeled the holes to be the size you would need for tapping. So I have an M3 tap here and I can go in and thread them nice and easily. And then I can take the part that's meant to go in right here and I've got a hole big enough for the threaded uh, part of the screw to pass through and a hole for the head of the screw and that seems to have worked out nicely. And then we can screw it in and see if it works the way we want it to. And there we go, we have our little lever and it doesn't quite want to move. And I think the uh, I think the part just needs to be shaped a little bit. I think, oh, you know what it is? I was talking about little goobers. There's a little goober in the corner here. I need to clean that out. I can go in with like an X-Acto or a rotary tool and clean that out. And that should give the clearance. And again, I think if I did a better job with my print orientation, that wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, this should be a nice sharp 90 degree angle, but it is not because of the printing. I haven't really done a ton of resin 3D printing. My, uh, both my other blaster builds like this, the uh, Vasha Stampede Revolver and the Blade Runner Blaster, those were all done on my FDM machine on my Ultimaker. So this is a bit of a learning experience for me and a lot of opportunities to learn. There are a lot of parts on this. So I'm gonna get a lot of experience printing and probably reprinting some of those pieces until I get them right. Like I said, these files will be available to you, so I wanna make sure they're good before they go out into the world. Those uh, other two I mentioned are also available over on our website, the Blade Runner Blaster and the Trigun Revolver. We'll have a link down below if you wanna print those yourself. All right, let's try this one more time. Now we're talking. It should only be able to open so far. Looks like it's opening further than it should be able to. Probably because this corner got a little bit munged up with the 3D printing. So I'll have to clean that up. It should only be able to go yay far and then when you push it down, it'll uh, press a little lever in to uh, release the catch on that. All right, it's pretty good, pretty good. Something else I noticed, it puts support material down in these holes here and I gotta go in and try and get those out so I can fit a screw through there. And I'm thinking those are probably unnecessary. So another check in the column for doing manual supports. Some of the parts require these tiny little M2 screws. And I do have an M2 tap, but I found that this just makes a bigger hole and uh, ends up stripping it. I don't know if these are, I think I just got really crappy taps. I ordered some newer ones that hopefully are better, but I did find that the uh, plastic, if I make the hole just the right size, I can just sort of self-thread these M2 screws right into the hole. I can just screw them right into the plastic and they'll kind of cut their own thread. So for the couple of spots where I need to use an M2 screw, I think that will do the trick. This is a little slide mechanism for the uh, release on the magazine. And I need to make sure that it can slide back and forth. It looks like 
the clearance I have here for the, the head of that needs to be cleaned up a little bit to get that to move back and forth. And then a spring goes in there and that's captured by our little, little grabby bits. Well, after a bunch of fiddling, I think I got this mostly working. This is supposed to slide down there and snap into place so that can't come out. And then you press this and it releases it. Now this isn't sliding back the way I want it to. There's a little more slop in everything than you end up thinking you're gonna get in the 3D model. Uh, I think part of that is um, you can see all the sanding I've done to sort of clean up some jankiness. This was printed with the support, supports all over this area and I think that I wanna print it in a way like that this part right here has no moving parts so I should put the supports over here so that this area is the cleanest so I know that moving forward, um, but at least I know my mechanism is pretty sound. Now I'm using one spring for both of these. This one doesn't do anything, it just returns it. And I'm starting to think maybe that uh, I'm not gonna use that same spring for both of them. I think I'll use this spring just for this side. Maybe this side will just be static. I can even just screw that in in a way that it won't move at all because it's not really gonna do anything. I just figured having a spring there would be cool, but it seems to be causing more problems than is necessary for a cosmetic thing. I have a few more parts to test fit, but otherwise I think I, I know some of the changes I need to make to the 3D model, mostly clearances so that parts can fit together better. This piece right here, I need to make sure it can rotate more freely. And there's a little bit of a slope I added to this piece to make it slot in easier and a few other little changes like that that I'll make to the models. That part works. Let's do that again. Yeah. It's been a few days of modeling and printing and test fitting all of my parts. I've had some successes and some failures. Uh, and I've come to a decision, I think. So uh, the reloading mechanism, I got that working pretty well. I think I can refine it just a little bit more, make it a little more bulletproof and easier to print. Oh, it still feels so good. But also uh, the sliding mechanism, I think I made it just too complicated. There's a lot of parts. I want this to slide when you pull the trigger, uh, but I ran into some issues. These little posts here are necessary for my sliding part. This guy was gonna go slide back and forth on there. Uh, and it's a little janky. It's a little backwards. There we go. Uh, to slide back and forth, but they're just too narrow. And in fact, I snapped that one trying to tap it, but also, the uh, trigger portion here, you can even see how thin that material is. You can see right through it. In fact, I cracked it over here trying to put it all together. As I was tinkering with that, I realized I'd have to make a whole lot of changes. And it's all integrated into this large frame piece, and I'd have to print that whole thing again. Uh, I could do it differently, but that would be an entire redesign. So I think what I'm going to end up doing is keeping what works, the reloading mechanism, and omitting the sliding mechanism. I'm just not gonna do it. Uh, I've been working on this project for two weeks now and I think I would rather spend my time getting this working perfectly and finishing the rest of the blaster uh, than spending the next three or four days troubleshooting this whole issue and printing a whole lot of new parts. Uh, so, for example, I'm gonna make this top slide part here, this part, and the frame and make that all one piece. It'll be easier to print that way uh, and I won't have to worry about any moving parts. I wanna make this part stronger and hopefully not see through. You can see I have a ton of parts over here on the table 
and I think I'm going to try and make that into fewer parts. So for example, this piece right here goes in there, uh, this piece goes in there, and that's really cool, but I don't think it's necessary that they be separate pieces. So I'm gonna integrate these right into that part as well. Again, fewer parts, simpler uh, assembly and all that. There's a few other things. There's text on the side of here and it looks pretty good, but I think I can make that a little more bold, make the text a little wider so it's easier to see. That could easily fill with paint. So I think I want that to be a little bit wider, a little easier to see. So I've got a few tweaks to make. I've got a list actually of things to go into Fusion and tweak before I get to print out the uh, next batch of parts, but I'm getting really excited. Everything looks great. The scale looks correct and it feels right. So I'm pretty stoked about the next few steps. It's going to be a lot of 3D modeling, 3D printing, and test fitting, um, but that's what prototyping is. And since I'm designing these files for other people to print, I want to make sure everything works before I send them out into the world. Uh, so that's what I will be spending the next few days doing. Out with the old. In with the new. This is my modified version. It's been the weekend. I spent most of that weekend printing this. This was a 16 hour print. Everything is simplified. There's still a separate barrel, uh, but the whole top part is all one giant solid piece. This makes things just a lot easier. And I'm excited to start putting this together. In fact, I've printed everything and I can start assembly. For reference, here are all the test pieces I printed uh, to get here. This whole assembly, I printed these parts a couple of times. Printed this rail piece a whole lot. I'm making good progress. This is not gonna be used. These are hopefully the final parts. We can start putting everything together. I still have to remove some support material, but I'm extremely happy with the results. I switched over to this opaque resin. I think it does a better job of handling the uh, detail for these mechanical pieces with hard edges. I've also started manually placing support material so that it makes sure to get corners of things and hard edges. And it seems to do a better job of maintaining those details on prints like this. So I'm starting to level up a little bit with the resin printing. I've certainly had a lot of practice over the last week or so. All right, I'm gonna remove all the support materials and we'll start tapping some holes and putting pieces together. There we go. This should be just about everything ready to go. I did find that I left a little bit of material in here so this won't fit. I'll update the 3D model, but for this, I'm not gonna reprint it. I'm just gonna go in there with a Dremel bit and remove the offending material. No one's ever gonna see it. So now we're ready to do some tapping. There are quite a few holes on this that are meant for an M3 screw. So I've got an M3 tap right here. And I'm gonna go in and tap all those holes so they're ready to go. There is also an M6 here. There's, there's a couple of different ones. Before tapping, I go in with the appropriate size drill. So for an M3, you want a 2.5 millimeter bit and I'm gonna just make sure these holes are nice and cleared out and make sure they're deep enough. I've found that if you bottom out your tap, that is if you have this go all the way into the bottom and it hits resistance, it'll spin and just rip the threads right out and then they're no good. So you wanna make sure that you are going deep enough with your uh, relief. And I've modeled these holes to be pretty deep. In fact, this one goes all the way through so does this one. They are deep enough, but sometimes the resin can get stuck in there and it'll cure and leave a little blockage. So we wanna make sure that they are cleared out and then we can go to our tap. And this is really soft material. It's really easy to tap it. Kind of what makes it so dangerous. You can, you can goof it up really easily. So it works well in a drill, but also lubrication helps a ton. So I just have some water here to help us out. And then I'm going to very slowly and carefully put a tap in that hole. Back it out a little bit, go back in. And I wanna stop before I hit any resistance. Just make sure that it is deep enough and then I've got this wire brush here to make sure that I clean that off so that when I go through the next one, I'm not gonna have it clogged up. Oop. 
Get a little water in there. So for this guy here, this part goes on it like that, and now this screw can go in, and we can screw it in like that for assembly. I'm gonna go ahead and do that to all of the other holes that need it on all of these parts before we move forward. Now that I've got everything tapped, I need to try and get all these pieces to fit together. So for example, there's this little knob I've got that's gonna slide in here, and hopefully, once it's all painted and glued together, that knob will be able to rotate. Uh, but uh, the 3D printing isn't flawless, so there's some uh, not perfect edges here that I need to clean up. So I've been using tools like these needle files, really useful. Got a bunch of different shapes and types of needle files. Of course, we'll have a link down below to all of the tools that I've been using. If you wanna go check those out for yourself. Uh, and I also have a link to our uh, 3D modeling course. We've got a four hour long video course on Fusion 360. All the skills I use, uh, all the basic skills anyway, to get started modeling in 3D uh, for 3D printing. Uh, super useful. I've heard from a lot of people who have taken the course and said things like, hey, you know, I've tried to get into CAD and I just couldn't grasp it until I watched your course and then it really stuck with me. So we'll have a link down below if you want to learn how to make stuff like this yourself in 3D and start printing uh, tomorrow. Next few parts on this beast right here are things like this uh, guard, uh, which again goes in like this. This will eventually get glued into place, but it doesn't fit perfectly. So I'm just going around and getting the fitment on everything uh, working correctly. I'm also cleaning up things like uh, artifacts from the 3D printing. You can see this should be a nice flat surface, but uh, anywhere where the supports touch down, there tends to be at least a little bit of deformation. So again, I've got these uh, sanding tools where I can go in and start sanding it. Uh, something important too, if you're kicking up a lot of this dust, you don't want to be breathing this in. So I've got a dust mask I'll put on uh, when I'm doing this kind of work. Uh, but I have to just go over every single little surface that's a little bit goofy like that and clean it up so it no looks nice. You can also use these sanding sticks. These are actually nail files. They have two different grits. I believe it's like a 100 grit and a 200 grit on different sizes. Those help a lot for this kind of work. Eventually, that'll get down to a nice smooth surface. Also, for the fitting, this piece here is meant to go down and there, and it fits okay, but not perfectly. So I can sand the uh, bit, the protrusion here, or I can go in and clean some material out of there until I get it to work correctly. So I just have my parts all lined up. The bottom of this piece here has quite a bit of work it needs. Going one after the other, getting everything cleaned up, uh, and to a state where I can maybe think about priming it for a full round round of sanding. There's a whole bunch of just surface stuff that needs to get cleaned up. There's a little bit of the artifacts from the printing that'll get cleaned up as well. Uh, so yeah, dust mask on, music on the stereo, and a whole bunch of sanding. I needed to hog out some material inside the barrel or where the barrel goes, but my uh, rotary tool obviously doesn't fit the full length of it. So I made this on my lathe. It's like an extended shank for the rotary tool. You can uh, use this set screw to loosen it. I just flattened the end of the shank right there so that it has something to snag onto. And uh, sure enough, it worked great. Like I now have an extendable rotary bit for those hard to reach places. And now, now the barrel fits in there. Like I said, I will update the 3D file so any further prints won't have this problem, but I didn't want to go and reprint this whole thing just because of that one little oopsie. How fun is that? <laughs> just stepped out for some fresh air. It's a rainy fall day here in Seattle. And I am having a great day in the shop. I am absolutely tickled that my new invention worked and I'm having so much fun putting this prop toy together. Just wanted to take a moment, and take it all in, absorb it before I move on to the next step. Also, I've been doing a lot of sanding and I could use a break. <laughs> all right, that's enough. Let's get back in there and have some more fun.
I think that's most of the sanding done. We're gonna prime it and see if I have to do any more. I was pretty thorough. Uh, these sanding um, buffing wheels, it's like a scotch Brite pad on the end of a rotary tool, so good. Um, they don't remove the layer lines, but they do that last layer of buffing really, really well. So I'll sand everything by hand and then go over it with this. Of course, it kicks up a ton of dust, hence the mask, but the results are worth it. This is looking terrific. Now, I wanna get everything primed, but I'm missing one piece. Well, two actually, four if you count both sides. The grips, those are gonna get CNC'd out of wood, and I think I wanna test fit them before I do any painting. So let's head over to that machine and cut out some wood. These pieces were just a test fit. This was the first one I did and it's just a little too snug. There's gonna be paint in there and that'll be a problem. So I decreased the outside perimeter of it just a little bit and now it fits perfectly. This lets me know that it's gonna fit. And then this piece right here. Oh, a perfect fit. So satisfying and I can test the screws and the threading. There we go. So that, that's looking pretty good. Really happy with that. I can go forward with the good wood. Got my reference image right here and I showed this to Woodworking Twitter and asked what kind of wood they thought this is and they gave me two options. The first is rosewood, which looks very pretty. I got a bunch of this because it was on sale at Rockler. Um, it's got a pretty good color, uh, although the wood grain isn't quite as tight as in the reference image. So I'm probably gonna go with option two, which is walnut. Not as red, although I have some finishes that should get it closer to that color. Uh, but the wood grain looks really nice and tight. This should treat us really well. Of course, I only have this one board right here, so I gotta make sure I nail it on like the first or maybe second try. Let's get to work. That was some exciting CNC. I don't do a lot of CNC work. I don't do it all the time. So I'm always learning and I still have a lot to learn. Didn't get everything perfect. There's this lip here. Not quite sure why that's there and I couldn't figure out how to tell the computer to do it, but that's fine. I've got sandpaper. I can finesse this thing and I'm gonna have to sand it all anyway. Uh, likewise with this, um, there's this texture on the top here. Uh, I could probably figure out how to go and I probably should have done a parallel pass on this instead of an adaptive clearing on that. But again, it's probably just quicker for me to take some sandpaper and clean it all up like that. So I'm gonna have to go over everything with the sandpaper anyway. Uh, more importantly though, does it fit? That's the wrong side. <laughs> and yes, yes it does fit. I've already tapped these holes of course. So the screws go through there and then screw into that hole. Now these use the same hole for opposing sides. So I did have to shorten these screws a little bit so they didn't meet in the middle. You can do that with you know, a rotary tool or a lathe or a grinder or a sander. A lot of ways to shorten a screw. That goes in like that and we give it a quick little tighten. I do want to be careful. It's so easy to just strip the plastic threads. So I may end up gluing these down on the final thing as well as screwing them, but uh, yeah, look at that. That works great. Let's do, uh, let's do the other one. Oh, like a glove. And uh, likewise, we've got some screws that hold that in there. I'll have a parts list for the, along with the 3D files with a list of all the screws I use. Like I said though, some of them will have to be shortened. There we go. <laughs> oh, it looks so great. I got the grain matching. So the grain goes in that direction on the grips. On this one, it goes that way. So I've got that nice and lined up. 
Uh, next, I just have to do some more sanding and finishing uh, and we'll get this thing primed up. Got everything sanded to a 200 grit, pretty happy with it. Now I'm just cleaning everything off with mineral spirits to prepare it for the finish. And this is what we're going with. Uh, not sponsored or anything, but I went to the Rockler near my house and got some good advice on the finish. I'm gonna use this tongue oil. Hopefully it gives it just a little color, makes it look a little more, whoop, a little more red as per our reference. But we're just cleaning up the surface right now. Get rid of the dust. Boy, just getting this a little wet makes it look so nice, doesn't it? Oh boy, I'm starting to understand. This will be our top coat, by the way. Starting to understand why all my woodworker friends enjoy this so much. <laughs> it's like a magic trick. You can't do that with plastic. You can't just get it wet and all of a sudden it looks amazing. Time to apply the finish. I've double stick taped some wood on the back of this so I have a grip thing. Now I can dunk into the oil and apply. We're just gonna put on as much as it'll take and let it soak in. Pretty, pretty simple process. The folks at uh, Rockler were very, very uh, helpful in describing how it's supposed to go. Really, we're just putting this oil on there and letting a bunch of it soak in. And I'll probably do that a couple times to really get it to absorb as much as possible. So I'll just do that to all my pieces here. It oh, looks so cool. <laughs> it looks so cool. While my grips are drying, I can start to prep my plastic bits for painting. Uh, I like to get everything sorted um, out on a piece of wood or something. These skewers are really good. I have a lot of holes that are just the right size so I can put a piece like that, drill a hole in this board and then I have that ready to go. I can spray it and then stick it in there and let it dry. So I'll drill a bunch of holes in this to have a whole field of bits like that. Uh, this big thing here, I'm probably gonna drill a hole in the bottom uh, key right there and then put a screw in it so I can dangle it from there. That way uh, I can paint it and let it hang. That'll probably be the best way to do that. And then we'll never see that screw hole. Very nice. And then everything else, like these really little bits here, let's not lose those. I've got this double-sided tape. This stuff is so useful in so many ways. I can lay down a couple strips of it on this two by four here, peel off the backing, and then I can take these small bits and stick them down on a surface that isn't gonna get painted. So, uh, for example, this face of this doesn't need to get painted. I can stick it down like that and it's not gonna, not gonna fall off. You do wanna make sure that you have enough room to get around it for painting. Uh, so that's definitely a factor. But otherwise, this is just the easiest way to have these parts all set up. Uh, some of these other pieces, so I don't wanna stick this down because I have to paint the ends of it, but I can take a piece of tape, any kind of tape, happen to have some gaff tape here, and I can just wrap that around one of my skewers until it is the right diameter for the inside of this. Let's see if we got it. Oh, so close, just a little more, maybe one more wrap. There we go, that'll be nice and snug on there so I can spray all around it, and then of course put it in a thing like that. I almost forgot to clean these parts. I've got some isopropyl alcohol here and a rag, just a uh, shop towel. And I want to wipe all these parts down because they're covered in dust. They may not look like it, but there's sanding dust all over these things. If you have like a degreaser, like a grease remover, that's really good to use. Uh, but isopropyl alcohol works quite well too, especially on these 3D printed resin parts. Just want to make sure there's no dust left over or finger greases from manhandling these things uh, that would in inhibit any of the um, paint.
paint to keep it from sticking down. Of course, we wanna make sure we get this big honking piece. There's lots of crevices and tiny little details that are, I can even see, see the dust. Gonna make sure we get it all wiped down. Here we go, we're all set. Got this ready to hang. Got everything else either stuck down here or on its own stick. I've even masked off a couple of places where I don't want there to be any paint. This uh, piece right here is gonna have a thing sliding into it. Don't want any paint on it. In fact, the other part that slides in there, I'm not even gonna paint this. We're gonna keep that in this jar with a couple of other things that aren't gonna get painted. But everything else is ready for the first round of primer. And I'm gonna use this fine surface primer. This is really nice stuff meant for models. We're gonna give everything a really good coat. It is the next day and my wooden parts look really, really terrific. I'm so happy with how they look, but I'm gonna give the oil a full other day to dry and I'll put the finish or the top coat on uh, in another 24 hours. I wanna make sure it's nice and dry. Not in a hurry, I still have a lot of other painting to do. Uh, and speaking of, let's look at these parts here. They're looking pretty great, but if we look up close, we'll see I might have a little more work to do. You can still see some layer lines right there. That'll need to be sanded out for sure. And I also have some crud on there from spray painting this outside at like nine o'clock at night. This side's even more egregious. I'm gonna have to go in and fill that with some spot putty. There's also some spots where I can still see the sanding marks from the previous layer, and I wanna fix that up before we do the final priming. That means wet sanding. This is a 200 grit. We'll go to 400 and probably 600 to get it nice and smooth. I got everything sanded to 400 grit. I'm just cleaning everything off because we're gonna prime it again. I'm thinking 400 grit will be good enough for my purposes. You can see I pretty much took the primer all the way off on most of these spots. Anywhere that I saw like a deep gouge or anything, I tried to sand until it was completely gone. So I think, I think we're in good shape here. Um, I will prime it again and then assess from there, but I'd really like to start painting this. Time to pick out my paints. I'm going with my Tamiya's because I've used them a lot and I trust them. For the main body here, it looks like a gunmetal. So I've got this gunmetal paint that I like a lot. Although it looks a little bit like it might be chipped along the edges. So I think I'm gonna base coat everything in this chrome silver first and then clear coat that. So it's nice and protected, let it dry for a day or two. Then go over it with the gunmetal, either with like a hairspray chipping or some way of peeling back the paint on the edges so that's the gunmetal. Uh, then there's a couple of other colors on here. So this magazine looking thing here is kind of brass looking. <laughs> I don't know. I've got some uh, gold leaf. That might be a little too gold. I could mix in just a dash of silver to tone it back a hair. The little flipper buttons are like that and the handguard is the same. Uh, and then this front part here is actually like a bronze color, a little maybe a little darker bronze. So I actually have the bronze paint ready to go. Uh, I might have to mix in something to darken that just a little bit as well. Uh, same with this front thing here. It looks like a darker metallic. It's darker than the gunmetal. So I maybe mix in a little black with this gunmetal to do just that front piece. Uh, but I think that is all of the paints. And of course the wood I don't need to worry about because I'm making it out of wood. Let's load up the airbrush and start spraying. <laughs> I have painted all of my parts. I got the base coat of paint down on them anyway. 
uh, just airbrushed everything on in all of their base colors. I got the silver put down on all the gunmetal parts. So these parts are uh, silver and I'm going to spray gunmetal over that. And then I'm going to strip a little bit of it away on the edges to make it look all worn. This is my test piece. I just sprayed a little bit of the gunmetal on top. And while it was still kind of wet, I hit it with a toothbrush and it gave me that really nice scratched effect. So that's what we're gonna end up doing. For the wooden grips, I went over it with this stuff here. The guys at uh, Rockler recommended it. And in fact, they have a video on their channel describing how to use it all. But basically, you put a brush a layer on, you wipe off the excess, let it dry for a day, you scuff it up, rinse and repeat. And I put uh, three layers on that. That should be more than enough. So now it's time to do that gunmetal finish. It's really fun. Can't wait to show you. I have my reference here ready to go. Um, it, this isn't done everywhere on the gun. It's actually pretty uh, subtle. So I wanna make sure I just hit a couple of little spots here and there where it makes sense. So this piece looks like it has a little bit of a scuff on the edge of it. I'll cover the whole thing and then we'll do a little bit of toothbrushing. Okay, that helped get it on its way. And now there's just a few scuffs right on this edge here. You can see we've got some neat looking scuff marks on there with the silver shining through. This I will let fully dry for at least another day before I get ready for assembly. I'm gonna go do the rest of the parts, but I'm gonna do them outside so I don't stink myself out of the shop. clearly a window when the paint is just dry enough that you can scuff it up. Uh, if you let it dry too much, then the paint won't come off. <laughs> so you kind of have to figure that out. That's why I had that small test piece I did to figure that out before committing to these uh, final parts here. But yeah, just, uh, it's even hard to see on camera, but yeah, a little, just a little bit on the edge of the, the barrel where you think this has a suppressor it's going to be put on and taken off you think that would leave some scratch marks you also don't want to do it when the paint is like still very wet because it'll pool and act a little weird the name of the game is subtlety here you can't i can't even really see that on camera this is a neat way to add just a little bit of extra something to your prop and i'm going by the reference in the game so the gunmetal parts these metallic gray looking parts are the only parts that have these scratches on them. The sort of brass looking piece doesn't have any of it. The, uh, the bronze looking part doesn't have it. And of course the wood wouldn't have it either. Those parts are just staying their solid base color. The end of the suppressor here would definitely have some scuffs. The part that sticks out that would get pressed into a holster. Having the clear coat over that silver helps protect it uh, and letting it dry <laughs> helps it protect it as well. Most of the scratches on this big part are around the front edge here. You would imagine again like this going in and out of a holster. Boy, that is almost too dry to do any scuffing. <laughs> Got some alcohol here, some isopropyl alcohol. And I'm going to use that as a thinner to help take off a little bit more of the paint. But I don't want it. I'm going to dry that off a bit. There we go. That'll chew back down through the gunmetal to the silver. And again, this is we're going for subtle here. I don't want to overdo this. Trying to redo this would be a huge pain. <laughs> well, it didn't go quite as expected. This paint dried really fast, but I did get some scuff marks. You can see right there. It's kind of hard to show on camera. These two paints are very close in color. Maybe if I, the, if I had tinted the uh, gunmetal a little, little darker, it would have got a little more of an obvious result. But like I said, we're going for subtlety. And that's exactly what we got. Very subtle scratch marks. I think it's pretty good. Overall, I'm like 90% happy with that. <laughs> I'm not disappointed enough to do it all over. <laughs> it's going to look so good, especially once we get a nice oil wash on this. But... Uh, the hardest part now, of course, is hanging this up and waiting for it to dry out. I want to give it a full day to dry before we do the assembly, which I'm incredibly excited about. I've been falling asleep thinking about putting this together for like the last week.
I think that just about wraps it up. We've got our magazine. We've got the suppressor that goes on right there. Screws in like that. And our rattler is totally done. And it looks so good. These wooden grips make me so happy. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Can't get enough of it. Oh, so, so good. Britt jumping in here at the end with the assist on camera. Thanks. Yeah. You're the best. Uh, Britt's been working on something else behind the scenes. We'll have more on that in a bit. Uh, but for now, uh, I have more Skyrim. Skyrim! Ha! <laughs> Space Skyrim to play more Starfield. Uh, I've put about 75 hours into this build and about 120 hours into the game. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. We'll have links to the files for this down below, along with links to our Fusion 360 course. If you want to learn some 3D modeling for 3D printing yourself. And yes, I was able to print all these parts on my FDM machine and they turned out great. Thank you tons to our extra credit club, the delightful human beings who keep us employed. If you want to join us over on Patreon or right here on YouTube memberships, you can. We thrive on that support. It keeps us going. Thank you. That'll do it for me in this epic build. It took me about just over three weeks to do, uh, and I already have a list of more things I want to make from the game. Hopefully you do too. If you do have a cool thing you want to make from uh, Starfield, let me know down in the comments. I want to stew in this world a little, a little longer. <laughs> That'll do it. Happy crafting. We'll see you in the next build.